Can you think of two rectangles which have the same perimeter, but which have areas that are one apart? If you can, you can answer today's math contest question. This is from the 2002 Armel, which is a test I had actually never heard of until I saw this problem in Art of Problem Solving's Introduction to Algebra book. I actually have not been able to find the original problem, but I'm reasonably sure it's from the 2002 Armel because of a particular math contest convention where if the test is given in a certain year, we often see that year in certain problems. And in this particular case, there's no special reason to have 2002 in this problem. So I think this probably is a question from the 2002 test. The question is this, compute the number of positive integers A for which there exists an integer B, zero is less than or equal to B is less than or equal to 2002, such that both of the quadratics x squared plus ax plus b and x squared plus ax plus b plus one have integer roots. This question came up in class and honestly it stumped me at first until I started to think about the area of some rectangles. Here's what I mean. There's this particular question you often confront when you work on quadratics in like eighth or ninth grade algebra. That is, if you have some fixed perimeter, if you have like a certain amount of fencing and you want to maximize the area that that fencing is enclosing, how do you do it? Take for example, a perimeter of 20. So that means that two of our side lengths are gonna add up to 10, right? Because of course the perimeter is going to be the sum of all four sides, so two sides at a time will be half as much. You might say, let's set up the fencing so that it makes a two by eight rectangle, which of course would have an area of 16. Pretty good, right? 16 square feet, yards, whatever. But then you think to yourself, well, what if we made it a little bit taller, but a little bit less wide? That is, for example, let's make it a three by seven rectangle instead. This would still have the proper perimeter, still have a perimeter of 20, but its area would actually increase quite a bit from 16 to 21. Three times seven makes 21. In fact, as we keep doing this process, as we make the figure more and more square-like, we end up finding that we get more and more area. So for example, if we make it into a four by six rectangle, we get an area of 24. And finally, if we actually go ahead and just make it a square, five by five square, that's gonna give us our maximized area of 25. The fact that these last two rectangles have the same perimeter, but areas that are one apart is really the key to answering this particular question. Because it's possible to represent each one of these rectangles as a particular polynomial. This five by five rectangle we can represent as the perfect square trinomial x squared plus 10x plus 25. And that's coming from an x by five binomial times an x by five binomial. So you can see basically we're taking the dimensions of the rectangle and using them as part of our binomial factors. Similarly, that four by six rectangle, we could represent as x plus four times x plus six, which would give us x squared plus 10x plus 24. And hopefully you can now see how this is fitting with what was requested of us. Our middle term, the linear term for each one of these quadratics is the same. In both cases, that positive 10 is coming from the sum of the two different dimensions, whether it's five plus five or four plus six, either way we get 10. But our constant terms are one apart, in one case 25 and in another case 24. This would correspond, for example, to a b equals 24, in which case we get one trinomial, x squared plus 10x plus 24, and then the other trinomial, one larger, x squared plus 10x plus 25. With that concrete example under our belt, the question becomes, how often does this happen? We've come up with one example, but they asked us how many different b there are, less than or equal to 2002, where this same thing happens. What we want to do now is leverage this concrete example and the other representation we've come up with to try and figure out all of the other scenarios where this happens. Using alternate representations like this to help us understand, for example, in this case, a math contest problem is one of the things that I'm really passionate about as a math teacher, which is why I'm so happy to have Brilliant.org sponsoring today's video. Brilliant has built an amazing platform for helping people develop the intuitions it would take to move between these different kinds of representations. Their platform helps you learn mathematics interactively and they have thousands of lessons. You can find lessons on AI, on data science, on foundational mathematics, even lessons on math contests contest problems. For example, you can see me clicking around here on their contest math modules. They've got two different modules with sample problems where not only do you get a chance to practice the kinds of mathematics that you would use for contests like the Armel, the one that we're doing today, the AMC, American Mathematics Competition, Math Counts, and more, but of course you actually have explanations, in-depth explanations you can see whenever you run into trouble. Whether you need help figuring out where you went wrong or why the right answer is the right answer, 
Brilliant's platform is ready to go. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, check out brilliant.org slash polymathematic or click on the link in this video's description and the first 200 of you to do this get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Whether you're a student tackling this stuff for the first time or, like me, a lifelong learner who just loves the challenge, Brilliant.org's platform has something for you. I hope you'll take advantage of the link. Again, Brilliant.org slash polymathematic, and thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. All right, back to the problem here. We have figured out one particular case where we have that same sum in the middle, that linear term that has the same coefficient, but then whose constant terms are one apart. And we can see that case comes from the area of a square compared to the area of an almost square, but not quite square rectangle. The question now is not can we come up with more examples, but can we make sure we come up with all possible examples given that constant term has to be less than or equal to 2002. And so what I'm gonna do is come up with a little chart here for a given A and a given B. For example, when A was 10, as we saw a moment ago, B was 24. And I'm just gonna put in parentheses here 25 so that I remember that was the value of the perfect square. It's always going to be one larger. But what was special about the 25 is that it was a perfect square. So if we come up with some other perfect square, that would represent some other square that we could make one unit shorter and one unit wider in order to get that one less area every single time. For example, you could just as easily imagine starting with a 4x4 square instead, which would have an area of 16. In our situation, that would mean the B that we're targeting is 15. If we make that a rectangle that's just a little bit shorter, 3 units tall, and a little bit longer, 5 units long, I can see an area of 16 versus an area of 15, and those are the B and B plus 1 values we are looking at in this table. If we were to state these as trinomials, we would get the perfect square trinomial, x squared plus 8x plus 16, coming from x plus 4 times x plus 4, and then the other one, x plus 3 times x plus 5, would give us the trinomial x squared plus 8x plus 15. But again, the key here is the middle term in each case matches the sum of those two dimensions. 4 plus 4 makes 8, and 3 plus 5 also makes 8. But when we do that one unit shorter and one unit longer, it's going to give us that area that is one unit less. And so the next time that happens, a is equal to 8. And now I have a little bit of a pattern. Every time a is an even number, I can split it in half for the square, and then I can make those dimensions one smaller and one larger for the rectangle. And that gives me the intuition that this problem is really about figuring out all the perfect squares and then working backwards from there. I want all the perfect squares that are less than or equal to 2002. That's going to begin at b equals zero, which would give us a perfect square of one. Again, the squares are the things that are one larger in every case here. And that would correspond to a equals two two, because what we're doing in each case is taking the square root and then doubling that to get our value for a. I'm not going to list everything in between, but of course it's going to also be the perfect squares 4 and 9, leading into 16 and 25 and 36, and so on, going all the way up to the last perfect square that is still less than or equal to 2002. And I'm reasonably sure that last perfect square is 1,936, coming from 44 squared. 1936 is equal to 44 squared. So if I had a perfect square that was 44 by 44 with an area of 1936, I could imagine that as the polynomial x squared plus 88x plus 1936. And if I make those dimensions just one shorter for my height and one longer for my width, I should get an area of 1935, corresponding to the polynomial x squared plus 88x plus 1935. And so that would be my b value here, 1935. And again, the a value in that case would correspond to the 88, that linear term in the middle that is the same in both cases. Our counting job is now just about adding up how many perfect squares there are. And if we write these out as perfect squares, we can see really we're just counting 1, 2, 3, 4 squared all the way up until 44 squared, which is 44 different numbers. So it should be the case that there are 44 different values for b, non-negative, right, has to start at zero and go all the way up until the last time that it happens at 1935 that work in this problem. The only other thing I'd say about this question is 
Although we know for sure those are 44 instances that work, you might be a little concerned that those aren't the only 44 instances that work. So the square rectangle thing, you might think, oh, that was nice, but how do we know those are the only times where we can keep that linear term the same and then vary our constant term by one and get two different polynomials with integer roots? What if there's some other situations we didn't consider? For a math contest, that's probably not necessary because most of the time with math contests, you need to be able to move through the problems relatively quickly. So while there might be a few wrinkles to it, we're not writing a paper, right? We're just trying to get the proper numeric answer and then move on. If we needed to though, we could investigate this situation with the quadratic formula, right? X is equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Remembering, of course, that our A, B, and C here don't necessarily correspond to whatever random A and B the problem has, but instead we're talking about the trinomial AX squared plus BX plus C. So in fact, the B of our quadratic formula is going to match the A of this particular problem. It's the coefficient of the linear term. The C is gonna match the constant term, which again, a little bit confusingly, in our problem is actually represented by B or B plus one. Once we take care of the weird variable stuff, however, this is what we get after we plug it into the quadratic formula. The roots of the b plus one quadratic will be represented by negative a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus four b minus four all over two, and the roots of the b quadratic will be negative a plus or minus the square root of a squared minus four b over two. We can now get a better sense of why a ended up needing to be an even number. In both cases, for these results to be an integer, a is gonna have to be divisible by two. Furthermore though, and this is the key to recognizing that the 44 possible solutions we found are in fact the only 44 possible solutions, for these two sets of roots to represent integers, whatever's under the square root sign must be a perfect square. So we can say that both a squared minus four b minus four and a squared minus 4b have to be perfect squares. But that's interesting because we can tell how far apart these are. These two numbers, whatever they are, we don't need a set equal to any particular perfect square to be able to see that the only difference between them is that minus four. Since clearly we wanna take the square root of a positive number, we wanna let the a squared minus four b be at least four so that when we subtract four away from it, we get another positive number that we can take the square root of over here to get those integer roots that we need. Even more importantly, however, knowing that these expressions represent two different quantities that must be perfect squares, we can actually limit our search to perfect squares that are four apart. And in fact, there are only two such perfect squares. The only two perfect squares that are four apart are zero and four themselves. And so we can tell that what's really happening here is a squared minus four b must be equal to four. With a little bit of manipulation, we can get the variables onto two different sides and you're gonna see something interesting happen. We get a squared equals four b plus four, which is another way of saying that a squared is equal to four times the quantity b plus one if we go ahead and factor out that common factor of four. Taking the square root on both sides, we can see this relationship is really telling us that a is going to be equal to twice the square root of b plus one, which is exactly what we said was happening in that table we created with all the possible a and b values. So this work with the quadratic formula confirms for us, not only did we find 44 possible examples of a and b pairs that satisfy what the question asked for, those must be the only such pairs. And therefore, we have fully answered this question. There are only 44 possible values of b beginning at zero, going all the way up through 2002, that would allow us to create these trinomials with integer roots who have the same linear term, that ax linear term, but whose constant terms are one apart. So there you go, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you again to brilliant.org for sponsoring today's video. Brilliant.org slash polymathematic. Check it out, the first 200 of you can get 20% off an annual premium subscription. They've got a great platform. I know you'll love it. I will see y'all next time.